What's up, my beautiful, glorious dream fasters? It is Danny Gallows, of course, who you think it was. And welcome back to the next video in my episode by episode review of Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. So today, we're going to be discussing another one of the most magical episodes in the entire show, episode six by Gelfling Hand. So this episode begins right where episode 5 left off, as we see all of our dream spacers. Is that a term? Sure, let's use it. Dream spacers are now being imprisoned and carted off back into the carriage and back to the Crystal Castle to be dealt with by the Skeksis, because they're all considered traitors at this point, of course. But thankfully, Rian, Naya, and Gurjin are still on the case, and Lore is still below in the secret chamber. And I love this scene so much because not only is it dramatic to see them all being dragged off to the Crystal Castle and imprisoned, all these very important characters being imprisoned, but I love that scene when Lore busts through the, the, the throne because Celadon is sitting there, you know, kind of contemplating her future, contemplating all the events that just took place and kind of figuring out what she's going to do. And then all of a sudden here comes Lore up from underneath, busts through the throne room, completely breaks the throne apart, and then goes running after Brea. And I love it so much because it's symbolic, right? It's not only cool to see Celadon get thrown on her ass, right? But it's also symbolic because Lore, being this ancient creature, right, comes up and busts through the throne and literally breaks it apart. As in, kind of, it's kind of like a fun way of saying, well, sorry Celadon, you're not queen yet. So thankfully, a little bit further down the road, Rien finally stops the carriage, which of course allows Lore time to catch up. And it's such a cool scene because, you know, the Skeksis have no idea who Lore is. Nobody really has any idea who Lore is. And seeing this huge pile of stones running through the woods, getting to the carriage, confronting the Skeksis and breaking everyone out, it's just such an epic scene. And it's, it's a really cool scene because not only does it cement Lore as Brea's kind of caretaker, right? we have that very touching scene uh, between Brea and Lore where she recognizes him finally as his protector, but it also shows that, you know, when the Skeksis are faced with adversity from a creature that they don't know, something not familiar to them that they can't control, they are wimps and they are fools and they are scared themselves. And they do, you know, rightfully so, run off into the woods. And I, I've always loved that scene because and Lore is just such a cool character, man. You don't mess with Lore. Now, after this, we get another truly beautiful scene where all of the Wind Sifters come in to take a piece of the All Madras crown to all of the other Madras scattered throughout Thra, following tradition, of course. This is what happens when the All Madra dies. The Wind Sifters come in, they deliver the piece of the crown to all the other Madras so they can bring it back to the new Madra. And, you know, again, here is the imagination of the Henson Company on full display. The reason why I love this scene particularly so much is because, you know, just like with the dynamics of lore or really anything in the show, the Henson Company's imagination is on full display here because, you know, it takes that creative mind to really think of something like, you know, what's a creative way? What's a super creative way? to deal with this crown. We have this crown here. Okay, well let's have these birds called wind sifters come in and take a piece of the crown to each of the madras, which causes them to come back and present themselves and give their faith and dedication to the new all madra, right? That's storytelling, man. That's storytelling at its finest, and I, I, I love it so much. But the major question is, how are the other madras going to react when they finally confront Celadon? Because you have to keep in mind that what's going on right now is unlike anything that has been going on in recent Gelfling history pertaining to the Almadra. You know, although Celadon believes that what she's doing is right and what she's doing is just, you gotta think a couple of the Almadras aren't gonna be on board with this. Because, you know, like, like I said, even though Celadon thinks she's right, she's taking a lot of really, really drastic measures here, like suggesting that they burn her mother instead of returning her to Thra, you guys got to remember this is the All Madra and Celadon and, and it's her mother and she's suggesting that instead of returning her to Thra that we should burn her, right? I mean this is, this can't stand. You know, somebody is going to call Celadon out eventually for this because she's just taking things way too far. But hey, at least we get that really cool scene between her and the librarian which gave us the most famous line in Age of Resistance ever, for shame. For Thra. I can't do it as well as she can. And now it's crystal desert time, baby. 
Oh man, I will never forget the first time I witnessed the Crystal Desert that I experienced the Crystal Desert in the show, that beautiful scene, the, the crystals sticking out of the desert, all the cool, strange little desert creatures, the sky painting. It was such a mystical, magical experience. And it's another one of those moments in the show where you know you sit there and you see that imagery and you really realize that, okay, wow, I'm on an adventure. I'm on a real fantasy adventure here, and I cannot wait to see where, the, where this group is going. Um, and we also get a very touching moment here between Brea and Deed. Of course, Brea is... Uh, now dealing with all of the dynamics surrounding her mother's death. She's really breaking down about her mother's death now. But Deet, this is when Deet reassures her that all she needs is friendship and that, you know, they can perform their own ceremony right here for her mother. Um, even though Brea can't be there physically for her, we can do things with friendship in the spirit of friendship to celebrate your mother because that's what friends do for each other. Again, this cements the great relationship between Brea and Dee. Again, you know, this is, this is the, the Vapra, right, and the Groton, the highest and the lowest coming together. Again, it's symbolic. There's that symbology there of the highest clan and the lowest clan coming together and melding together as one, and that's exactly what the Gelfling need. Now, after this, we're led into one of the most important scenes in the episode, and that is where Agra finds Urva the archer again in the forest, and by this time he can see that her eye is open, she has found the Song of Thra, she is reconnected with Thra, and she now sees all paths laid out before her. But the one thing that she can't see is how this all ends, and Urva can tell that this has something directly to do with him. There's a direct connection between him and how this all ends. And we all know what this is, if, if, you know, obviously we've all watched the show a hundred times by this point, so we all know what this is. But at this point in the show, she's not really sure, but we know that it has something to do with Urva defeating his other half, which he believes that he can't do, obviously, because he will perish as well. So he's confused about this. He doesn't really understand what that means. He knows it has something to do with Skekmal, and he has a direct connection to the end of the story, to how things end but we're just not sure yet. So things, we have to let events play out as they do. But we all know that Urva has a very, very strong, important connection to this story, and it's about his path is about to be laid out before him very soon. Now, following this is arguably the most beautiful scene, the most beautiful, powerful, and touching scene in the entire show. And I know I've said that a lot, right? But, you know, it's true. There are just so many scenes like that, right? But this is, again, arguably, probably, the best scene, the most powerful, beautiful, emotional scene in the entire show. And that is when Kylan uh, uh, offers to lead a ceremony for Brea with a dream stitch. And dream stitches are these objects which imbue a person's life energy onto them by the person sharing their memories. It'll bring a person's essence and life spirit into this object. And, man, I mean, this scene is just so beautiful, you know, as Brea becomes comfortable enough to share her, uh, her own tale about her mother after being kind of, um, kind of led on by Rianne, because Rianne is talking about his father and his connection to his father and his emotions about his father, and this encourages Brea to start talking about her mother. And as they sing, and the dream stitch rises above the fire, and, and you can see the all Madras energy kind of come into this object, and the music is rising and crescendoing and beautifully flowing throughout the scene and just carrying the entire scene, weaving all these dramatic emotions together between all of the Gelfling. And I love how they cut that campfire with Celadon's fire, lighting the Almadra on fire on the cliffside and her very emotional goodbye to her mother. Emotional yet crazed goodbye to her mother. And then all of a sudden that fire fades into the Crystal Castle. I mean, it's just brilliant directing, absolutely brilliant directing going on this show, and it just pulls so many emotions out of you. It just, you know, it makes you want to weep, not only because of the emotion itself and how sad it is, right, how powerful it is, but just because you're so appreciative of how much magic went into this show, not, not just the components of the show, such as character design and storytelling and, uh, you know, um, 
uh, uh, world building and stuff like that, but also just the fact that so much passion was put into it. That's what makes you emotional about the whole thing, is how much passion was put into it, how you don't even see this in a lot of live action television shows, don't even come close to conveying this emotion, but a show with puppets has this much emotion and this much power to it. So that's why it'll always be one of my favorite scenes in particular, is because it really shows you in that moment that, again, just like I was talking about in a, in a previous episode, you know, Dark Crystal is very, very different. It's a very, very different show. Extremely different. And that scene is one of the many scenes that really proves that fact. So now at this point, as we return to the Gelfling guards at the Crystal Castle, we can see that rumors are starting to spread. Actually, they're not even rumors at this point. Truth is starting to spread. Word is starting to get around about the treachery of the Skeksis. And now everybody is starting to believe all of the rumors and all of the word that's spreading. And now the Gelfling are starting to rally behind each other, realizing that the Skeksis are truly evil and they have to do something about it. Well, everybody except for Atolian, of course, Gotta love Tolian, right? The, the, ever, the ever faithful Gelfling. But um, at this point also, uh, Skeksil, the Chamberlain, returns to the Crystal Castle and hears about the slaughtering of the Almadra. And he runs back off to Skexo hoping that he's going to win favor back with him because he thinks that, okay, you know, the general just killed the Almadra on a whim. Surely Skexo is going to be mad, the general is going to be punished. But no, instead he goes back and he finds the exact opposite. He finds the Skeksis having, Skeksis having a big banquet meal filled with plenty of essence, and he's like, well, what's going on? And Skexo is basically like, well, you know what's going on right now? Word is out. What the general just did, the action that the general just took, well, he basically just freed us from everything we have to do. We no longer have to hold the system of hierarchy above the Gelfling. The culling is in full force. The culling has begun. And Skeksil, of course, is very, very reserved about this. He's like, because he was the one that had originally advised the Emperor not to kill off the Gel all the Gelfling at once. But, uh, you know, just so happens that this does have its benefits. Because now that the stone in the wood has rebelled against the Chamberlain, rebelled against one of their lords, they have inadvertently provided them with their next meal. So now the Skeksis are headed off to Stone in the Wood, and we all know what a dramatic scene is coming next. So now as we return to the Crystal Desert, this is where we're finally introduced to Rakir, one of my all-time favorite characters. And he comes riding in on Bennu, his great big crystal skimmer, and he has heard their song from their, their dream stitch ceremony from the other night. He heard their song carried across the air, and his people were so moved by this that he has actually come to offer them assistance to get across the Crystal Desert to go wherever they need to go, a service which they, of course, gratefully accept. And, you know, just like I said, Rakir is one of my favorite characters because this is our official introduction to the Dusan clan. The Dusan clan are my favorite Gelfling clan of all time. I just... Rakir is such a perfect example, a perfect representation, and a perfect introduction to the Dusan, you know, because he has all of their best qualities and components, right? I mean, the, the Sandmasters, the Xerix, the rituals, the worshipping of death, the tattoos, right? This, the overall design of the character. I love this clan so much, and I'm so, I'm honestly kind of disappointed that we didn't get a lot of expansion with the Doosan, and hopefully we'll get that in Season 2. Keep your claws crossed. And then we finally arrive at the scene that everyone has been waiting for to cap off the entire episode when all of the Madras are back in Harar confronting Celadon to give them either her blessings or their refusals. And surprisingly, all of the other Madras give their blessing to Celadon except for Madra Fera in the Stonewood clan and Madra Lesaid from the Drenchen, who both withhold. And what this means is that they do not accept Celadon as the Al Madra, because just as Madra Fera mentions, war is coming and Celadon is not the person to lead us. So, Madra Fera ch uh, challenges Celadon to a trial by air, because obviously, you know, something's going to be done, something serious like that has to be done. A trial has to commence if you, if, if you don't accept the new Madra. You've got to literally battle for it. So she, she challenges her to a trial by air. 
which she surprisingly loses. Celadon's a lot stronger than she looks, a little bit more crafty than she looks, right? So she surprisingly loses this battle, and also probably because Celadon was dressed like a Skeksis. That definitely had something to do with it, probably. So she loses, and all of the Gelfling Madras at this point must accept Celadon. And it's, it's so great. I love the way that the episode ends because, you know, the Madras, even the other Madras who accept Celadon are kind of saying to her, you know, like, this is not the Gelfling way. This is not how we do things. And Celadon just simply says to them, it is now. And now Celadon is the new Dark Queen of the Gelfling, and that is where our episode ends. So in terms of what I relearned watching this episode, and this is going to cover the last couple episodes because I didn't do the What I Learned segment for those episodes, but you know what I was realizing is I realized how many times I've said over the course of this entire series, I've said, this is my favorite scene, this is my favorite moment, this is the coolest scene, this is the best moment, this is the most important scene, this is the most magical moment, this is the most magical character, this is the most important character. Where you hear me repeating these phrases, over and over and over again, but it's so true. You can't pick a favorite scene, you can't pick a favorite character, you can't pick a favorite moment. The entire show is filled to the brim with so much magic. Everything about the show is so pure and so, uh, so filled with life and emotion and passion. There is not a single scene in this entire show, all ten episodes, there's not a single scene that isn't filled with power, that isn't filled with magic, that isn't filled with some kind of brilliance, right? And that's what Dark Crystal Age of Resistance does so well, is that there, there is no episode or moment or kind of event or character or something like that that makes you say, makes you question the show. Makes you look at it and be like, ah, oh, you know, like, maybe that didn't like that aspect of the show, or this show, this part of it was a little bit lackluster, I didn't really enjoy that, this kind of tainted my entire experience of that episode. That doesn't exist on Age of Resistance. The only thing that exists on Age of Resistance is pure magic. That's what this show does so well, is that it takes all ten episodes, and it makes an A-plus movie out of all ten episodes that keeps you wanting more. And make, and it's, it's the kind of show that where, you know, it ends when those end credits come up, you know, you just sit there staring at the TV screen wanting it, wanting it to come back. And that's what's so heartbreaking about the, the last episode and about the cancellation of Age of Resistance, is that when we knew that ten episodes was all there is, that's all we were getting with those ten episodes, now there's a little bit more heartbreak watching the show because you know that that magic isn't returning. The show was so unbelievably good that not one single scene was bad, not one single moment is bad, it's just so pure and magical. And that's why I love this show so much is because of the craft that was put into it. Every single moment and every single scene is your favorite. And that's what makes the show so great. That's why I love Age of Resistance so much. Alright, my friends, well, that's enough blathering from yours truly for right now. Definitely because I'm sweating bullets. It's like 90 degrees in here. I gotta stop filming this video uh, pretty soon before I completely melt into the ground. But don't worry, because now comes the best part of the video where I turn it over to all of you. So now is your chance to discuss all of your favorite moments, your favorite scenes, your favorite characters from this episode, and why. Leave all of your thoughts and opinions down below in the Great White Void. And as always, until next week, mate, take care, and I'll see you guys back here for the next review, which will be on next Monday. I had a little bit of a change up to the schedule, in case you guys didn't see my post on Twitter. I'm going to be uploading these videos on Mondays now instead of Fridays, so just a little FYI for you guys to expect these videos on Monday. But yeah guys, until next week, take care. Fourth Raw, for Jim, forever.